Good morning. Good morning. My name is Isaac Piper. I'm the AIM moderator this morning. All right, Isaac, how are you? Can you hear me fine? Oh, yeah. I can hear you just great. I love the effect that my screen does when I come back to the hopping screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can, well, I've, I've done that too with mine. <laughs> Very good. So we'll get started here in a few minutes, I think, or about five minutes out. Yep. And when I switch over to the PowerPoint, you can see this fine, correct? Yes, looks great. Perfect. So, and, and Darby, yes, the, that's my son's Death Star. Oh, Look. awesome. Lego? Yeah. Oh, I'm into it. I'm into it. We gotta we gotta fix it up a little bit and uh it, it's moved twice since we built it, so a lot of the peripheral pieces have, have fallen off. They're all in bins somewhere. We need to um find them and finish finish putting it together. I was jealous of that guy that built the giant Millennium Falcon. He, what was it, the biggest kit Lego's ever made? Oh yeah. That was I think that was the Superstar Destroyer. Oh, was it? Okay. okay. I had a friend of mine that built that. That thing was, I mean, it was massive. It was five feet long. Wow. I mean, there's no way you could pick that up as a kid and play with it. It's a, put that in a glass case. <laughs> For real. So, yeah, I uh, took my girls out the other night. We went to Walmart. We found a, a deal on Legos. We got uh, 3,000 Legos for half price. That is awesome. Yeah, just the classics. So we're playing, that's what we're going to do for Thanksgiving. Can't go over to anybody's house with all that big family stuff gone. <laughs> so we'll just stay at home and build yeah. a Lego city. Why not? Oh, I, I spent hours playing Legos. My kid, my, my, my mom sending them all to my boys. And, and Darby, yes, I, I, I would have loved to have got the Super Sider story too, but I would have kept it in the box. I never would have opened it because that those things appreciate so much in value. I like, take a look at the Legos that I destroyed as a kid that if I never played with them, I'd be, I'd be rich right now. Oh, yeah. So uh, my daughter's into Ninjago. Yep. And the really, really irritating thing, and they're doing this on purpose, of course, but the irritating thing is she wants all of the characters. But if you want to buy just all of the characters, it's like $80 for six Legos. Wow. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. So I think we'll get started here in another few minutes. Um, so, I, uh, so Isaac, are you going to be in the session the entire time? Uh, well, I will jump out and just I'll be observing and uh, I'll be available in the chat. Okay. Do you know, is there a way I can present the PowerPoint from this screen so that I can see the chat session? Because when I go to the PowerPoint, I can't see the chat. No, most people, no. But uh, if people, you're usually doing the questions at the end. Okay. Uh, that is my thought is to do the questions at the end then. Okay. Otherwise, I could say I could stay in here and then monitor the chat for you if you wanted to do it that way. But um, I'm, I'm happy to do either one. Yeah, no problem. I think we'll just do questions at the end. I've only got like four, maybe five slides to to, to go through, and then you know, hopefully, you know, spark some some good conversation from from the audience. Absolutely. Yeah, so it looks like we've got twelve people in. So I'm going to switch over to the PowerPoint, and this is showing fine. Uh, yeah, it, it looks good. The main title is great. That your information about yourself is a little small down at the bottom, but otherwise it's okay. Yeah, and I figure if people want this, they can reach out to me. I put my contact information at the end, so I have no problem sending it out if people want to see it. Cool. So yeah, it's just about time here. Hogwarts Castle, huh, Darvi? <laughs> uh, I haven't done much with the Harry Potter stuff, but yeah, that's awesome. All right. <clears throat> so we've got about 15 people in. Um, 
why don't we get started? It's uh, right here at nine Pacific, eleven Central. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, and first, you know, thank uh, Aim for for asking me to to participate. I hope everyone's going to find this and enjoyable. For those that don't know me, my name is uh, Thomas Sawinski. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Business Applications at uh, Berkshire Hathaway Homestake Company. I think in the bio it said Home, home Services, um, but it's Homestake Companies. We are actually uh, one of the larger workers' comp insurers in the country. Um, we're the largest in California, and so our focus is strictly on workers' comp insurance. Um, my role there is to build all the applications. Uh, well, my team builds them. I, I don't think they want me coding anymore. My fingers are a bit rusty, but uh, they build all the applications that all of our customers use. Um, and so we're very, very customer-centric in, in how we deliver things. Our goal is to deliver more value um, for our customers tomorrow than they have today. And so we, we, we have a very product-focused, agile mindset set in terms of delivering features and functionality. Uh, we're really kind of, you know, if you think of, you know, building an insure tech within a, a well-known company like Berkshire Hathaway, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I've been in management for, you know, 10 years of direct line managing people uh, over 10 years now, I think. And um, but before that, being a project manager, you know, there's a lot of things that I learned along the way and I kind of learned them, um, you know, I'd say in the, in the hard way. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do here today is provide some of the things that I've learned along the way and share them with you so that, uh, you know, for, for new managers or aspiring managers, you've got some ideas on, on, on how to improve yourselves, how to improve your teams and, and make everyone better. So hopefully you'll enjoy this. Um, I've left some time so that we can have some interaction um, after the presentation is over. Uh, I, I cannot see any of the chat session while I have the PowerPoint up, but I will switch over to the, the chat session afterwards and uh, we can certainly go through any questions that you have in there. So uh, if you can just hold your questions until the end, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering them. To start off first, you know, uh, our, our sponsors that put this event on, um, you know, thank you to all of them. Uh, it wouldn't be possible to do this without them. So uh, please take a moment, see all the, the partners. I'm sure some of you might work for them uh, or certainly use their, their services. So first thing about leadership um, is mentorship. Um, mentorship has been important for me both in, in finding mentors and being a mentor, but it wasn't something that, uh, you know, came very naturally at first when I started off, you know, as a manager. Um, so the first thing is really find someone to be a mentor for you. You know, you, as you're going through your career, find a person that, you know, if they're in a similar, similar career field as you, like someone who knows what you're going through, someone who understands it, um, someone who's longer tenured than you might be. And it doesn't have to necessarily be someone who is older than you. You could change fields, you could get, you could be a newer manager at an older age. Your mentor might be younger than you, but find someone who's longer tenured, someone who's been in the role or has done that role and has progressed on, someone who can understand the experiences that you're going through. And then try to pick someone who is one or two levels above you. Right. Where is it that you aspire to be? You may just be a manager today, but you might want to become a supervisor. You might want to become a director. You might want to become a, a vice president or eventually a CIO, CEO of a company at some point. So what you need to do is find a person, and sometimes it could be multiple people, that they're, they're gone through what you're going through. They can give you the feedback and the advice, and they're one or two levels above you so that they can give you advice on what you're going through, but also give you advice on things that you can do to be better to try and get to the level that you aspire to be at. Then uh, hidden mentors, and, 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 and some of you may do this, some of you may not, but what I've found is that there's been so many people along my career that have been a mentor to me that they never knew they were. And, and what do I mean by that? Observe the behaviors of people that you admire. There's people you work with, um, people in your everyday lives, people that you see and observe and you admire how they act, you admire how people respond to how they act. What are the behaviors that make you admire them? Like, what is it that they specifically do? What is it that you like? What are those character traits, right? Like, how do they conduct themselves in various situations, in various meetings? Sometimes it could be you know, something that's high pressure, sometimes it could just be an after social event, but what about these people and how they conduct themselves, what they do that you admire? 
and how can you adapt and, 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 and leverage what you're seeing to, to make yourself better as a manager? But then on the converse of it is a mentors can also be negative mentors, right? What are the behaviors of people that you don't admire? People that, you know, they, they have um, behaviors or actions that people don't like, people don't attribute to and observe those and say, I don't want to be like that. So be conscious of it so that you don't, you don't fall into that trap and, and, and you're doing what the mentors you admire do, not what the mentors you do not admire. Um, and then lastly, become a mentor, right? I, I, there's nothing better than, you know, having, you know, some knowledge, some wisdom and, and you know, give it back pay it forward, right? Because, you know, today you might be the person that needs to be mentored and, and, and have advice and guidance. And I, even at my level, I still have mentors today. You know, there, I, I have people that I talk with and we have, you know, one-on-one -on -one informal conversations, but then there's people I mentor and I share my experience and I give back to them because it's important for us to give back and pay it forward. And the reason I say that is, is that there's people that, you know, smart individuals are getting into management for the first time, um, it might be an entry level supervisor, they're going to have a long career. It's the onus is on us is to is to help them become better, help them become the future leaders in the organization because at one point the current leaders, they're going to retire. And and you're going to need to groom that next group of leaders in your organization to 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 backfill them. And so being a mentor, helping people along, it's a two-way street. So even in my role today, I have mentors that mentor me. I also mentor other people. Um, and I have many, many hidden mentors that they have no idea that they're even a mentor to me. Um, so mentorship, it's critical um, in, in, in all different phases. So certainly, you know, seek out to find a mentor and be a mentor. And then the next topic, management versus leadership. And I thought the Steve Jobs quote was, was, was great. You know, management is about persuading people to do things they do not want to do, while leadership is about inspiring people to do things they never thought they could. Management and leadership are two totally different things. They're both needed. There's both a, a, a role for it. But management is the administration of an organization. So it's dealing with the day-to-day -day people, you know, the processes, um, making sure work is getting done. Leadership is providing a vision and inspiring people. Who do we want to be as an organization? How do we as a department want to, where, where do we want to be? How do we want to deliver products for our customers? How do we inspire the people to take a look at something that they may not have ever done, to go in a direction they may not have gone before and say, yes, we're going to follow you. And, and being that leader is a little bit harder than being a manager. Now, just because you're a manager doesn't mean you're a leader. And a leader does not have to be a manager. I know plenty of people in my career who are great managers, and we need great managers, but they're not leaders. I know plenty of people who are leaders who aren't managers. And they may be individual contributors, but they're highly respected for their role, for what they bring, um, for their technical acumen. Um, and people will respect that person, and that person has leadership qualities but doesn't have to be a manager. So being a manager doesn't mean you're a leader and being a leader doesn't mean you have to be a manager. Those two can be mutually exclusive, but the key is you need to have that intersection, that join between them so that you can both be an effective manager while also being a leader that has a vision of where you're going. Um, so a couple of differences between a manager and the leader. Um, so a manager administers, a leader innovates. A manager maintains, a leader develops. A manager focuses on structures, a leader focuses on people. The manager relies on control, the leader inspires trust. The manager has a short range view on what needs to be done. The leader has a long range perspective of where we need to go. The manager asks how and when. The leader asks what and why. The manager has an eye to the bottom line, while the leader has the eye to the future. The manager accepts what is, the leader challenges. The manager is a good soldier and the leader is their own person. Now, these are traits that all companies are going to need. And to be an effective you know, manager slash leader, you, you want to encompass both of these. But it's okay if you don't. There are some people who are great managers. 
there are some people who are great leaders and understanding the difference between the two and which one you want to be and how you want to be that person, making sure that you know where the difference lies is going to be critical in your career um, because it is very, very important to understand the two differences. So now understanding power, right? And, and, and we all have ideas of what power could be. Um, when, you, when, you, when you think of power, there's really two types when you boil it down to it. Power that is inherited from a title. So your title gives you power. With your title, you have certain authority. But then power that is earned. And this is the power that you earn because you have the respect of your people, your people love you, they want to do things for you, they'll go through brick walls for you. That is power that is earned. So when you think of historical figures and the different types of power that they had, Joseph Stalin, powerful, powerful man, an ally during World War II. He helped us defeat um, the Nazis in, 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 in Europe. But he was, he ruled with an iron fist. He ruled through fear and intimidation. The Soviet Union wasn't prepared for World War II because he felt threatened by his generals and he purged and executed all of his generals because he was threatened by them. He ruled through fear and intimidation. He had the power because he was the head of the Soviet Union, but I don't think he had the admiration of his people. But then when you look at somebody who has earned their power, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was revered across the world. He never was an elected leader. He was somebody who people loved because of what he did. He had the respect of world leaders. World leaders sought his advice and counsel. He was an extremely powerful person. He earned his power. He never inherited it from a title. Mahatma Gandhi did a lot of great things for the world and his power was earned. And so two different people who had very distinct types of power, one, one the leader of, of the Soviet Union, one who had the earned power and was respected and revered by leaders throughout the world. And so they're two different types. So just because you have a title, right, and why this is important, just because you have the title doesn't mean that you just get to go and boss and tell people what to do. You want to have the power that is earned so that your team respects you, they revere you, and when you have the earned power of your team, they will move mountains for you. You will set visions for them and they will follow and they will do it. They may be uncomfortable, they may be unsure, they may question at times, but they're going to have their trust in you because you've earned their power. Don't try to rule because you have power coming from your title. Earn the respect of your people so that you can, you can effectively lead and manage them. And finally, be a coach. Um, and um, I think some of my team might be on this call and they all know that uh, you're not getting through a presentation that I make usually without some sort of a football or soccer reference here. And uh, my favorite my favorite uh, club here is Liverpool. And uh, that's Jurgen Klopp. If you don't know who Jurgen Klopp is, uh, he's, the, he's the manager of Liverpool. Um, great coach. He's done amazing things with the club in the last five years since, since he took over. But being a coach means many different things, right? So it's setting the vision for your team. We talked about vision a little bit earlier, and we, 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 we talked about that as a leadership trait and saying, who do we want to be? How do we want to be? You know, what is the style that we want to have as an organization? Um, you know, and, and certainly in Jurgen Klopp's case, many different factors go into who he's aspiring Liverpool to be, obviously the best in the world, and I think they've accomplished that. Um, and so now, you know, what's next? He set a vision and he, he, he achieved it for the team. But he clearly defined objectives. There are certain things we're going to do. We need to be clear with our teams what their goals and objectives are. How are we going to measure you? If, if the team is not clear on what they need to do to achieve that vision, if they're not clear on how they're going to be you know, measured, it makes it difficult. So you, as a coach, you need to clearly define your objectives for your, for your team. And then hold yourself and the team accountable. Um, you need to, you know, set those goals, be clear with them, make sure they're understood, and then hold people accountable for, for what they do. And ultimately, you are accountable for what your team produces. And so, you know, the, the, the proverbial buck stops here. Everything my team does stops with me. 
I'm accountable for everything that they do. Now there might be people and 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 and, and leaders and, and and whatnot underneath me that are accountable for certain aspects, and there's people who are responsible for certain things. But at the end of the day, I'm accountable to to our organization for what our team produces. Make your team better. Take a look at your team. What is it you're trying to do? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? How can you make your team better? Is there certain positions that you need to go and hire for that you need to bring in? Do you need um, maybe to bring on short-term contractors to help you get through through something that is a, is a project or an effort that you're trying to deliver? Um, how is it that you need to make your team better, whether it's through you know, training, um, getting additional you know, knowledge transfer for, for, for someone? Uh, but your job as a coach is to make sure your team is working optimal. And so understand where the gaps are and how do you make them better? And then give them the support they need, right? You know, whether it's training, it could be on the job, it could be a classroom, it's going to, you know, going to an, an external class, getting them online training, whether it's from like a place like Udemy or, or, or something, get your team the training and encourage them. I want my team to get better. I don't think I've ever said no to any training class. Um, I want them to, to, to learn, I want them to get better, and you need to give them the support and the time to do that. Um, it's critical for, for your team success and, and, and their success. And then here's a, here's, a, here's a unique one. Provide them with the problem, set the guardrails, and let them determine the solution. You know, as a coach, Jurgen Klopp doesn't play the game. He doesn't go out in the field. He stands on the sideline. As soon as that whistle blows, whatever happens on the field, the team is playing the game. So what as 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 leaders, as coaches, what we need to do is clearly say what the problem we're trying to solve is. There might be some guardrails that we have to put around, right? There's some constraints, and, and those can be time constraints, financial constraints, um, technology constraints. There might be some constraints we have to play with, but then let them determine the solution. I've got plenty of ideas. I've got plenty of, you know, things that I'd like us to do, like us to try. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, as I said before, it, it, I, I don't code as often as I used to, and I don't code in some of the languages we're using now. Um, I still understand software engineering, but my fingers have gotten rusty. Why would I be the one determining the solution? I brought in very strong, very smart, very intelligent people. Let them determine the solution. You tell me. And here's what happens. When you have your team determine the solution, they're bought into it. They want to make that solution work. It's not a top-down approach that says you're going to do something and the team is only doing it because they're being told to do it. If you give them the problem and let them determine what the solution is, they will. They are more bought into it and they will deliver on that solution because it's something that they came up with. They feel pride. They feel ownership. And it's not something they're doing because they're being told to do it. They're doing it because they understand how it helps the organization. And so don't always be the one to solution everything for your teams. Give them the support they need so that they can determine what the most optimal solution may be. Let them know it's okay to fail. Failure is okay. It is okay to fail. If you have a well-constructed hypothesis on something you're going to try and it doesn't work, that's all right. What did you learn from it? Failure is the first opportunity to learn. You take a look at, you know, any great inventor, right? You look at Thomas Edison, who, you know, developed a light bulb. And it, he, he failed more time. He, he and his team, they failed more times than not before they could get a light bulb to work. And if you haven't, a great, great movie that's out now, I can't remember if it's Netflix or Amazon, but it's called The Current War. And it's about um, Thomas Edison and... Um, uh, uh, Westinghouse, uh, for his first time, uh, George Westinghouse. And when they were trying to come up with, you know, whether it is an alter alternate current or direct current energy, and it's amazing to see what they went through. And in some situations, people died in their failures, in their quest to provide power. Everything that's powering what we're doing today, people died. I mean, that's a, that's a massive failure. Somebody got killed. But look at what they produced. They didn't stop. They plowed forward. Failure is okay. The only time failure is not okay is if you fail to learn. If you keep making the same mistake over and over, you're not learning from your failures. But your team needs to understand that 
making a mistake, it may hurt in the moment, but if they learn from it and they make things better, it makes you, it makes your organization, it makes your team better. Don't make them afraid of failure because they will be gun shy. They will not try new things. They will not be innovative. They will not be creative because they're afraid that if they fail, they're going to be held back. With innovation, with creativity, failure will ultimately come. And it's how you manage the results of that and letting your team know it's okay to fail at times. So here's a key one. You take the blame, the team takes the success. You know, my team fails, I fail. My team succeeds, my team succeeds. Don't be afraid of standing up and saying, look, as I said before, you're accountable for what your team does. So when they, so when they, there's you know an issue or something happens, you stand in front of it and you say, yep, here's what happened, here's the issue, we will fix it. You don't throw your team under the bus. You, 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 you let them take the success. You always, you know, when things go well, it was the teams. When things don't go well, it was you. You, you, you will get so much respect from your team and from your peers and from others for taking ownership and accountability of things and making sure things get fixed. Because at the end of the day, just because you're taking the blame because there may have been a failure, you're still signaling it's okay to fail because look, I'm taking the ownership of it, we're gonna fix it, and we're gonna get stronger because of it. It's a learning opportunity. Keep your emotion in check. This is hard for all of us to do, but your team really will follow your lead. If you're highly stressed, if you're being seen as frustrated, your team will be stressed and frustrated. Try to lead with a calm demeanor. Don't get too overly excited. Don't get too overly upset or angry. Try to lead with a calm demeanor because your team is going to follow where you're going. If you are unhappy about something, your team's going to be unhappy about it. If you're frustrated, you're having a bad day, your team will pick up on it. Your team's going to follow your lead. So make sure that you're holding your emotion in check and you're understanding your own emotions. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not free to have them. You've got your mentors, you've got your trusted counsel, you know, you'll get trusted people that you can talk with. Um, you have your direct line manager. If you're frustrated, if something's bothering you, there's avenues for you to, to share. And there's a great line from private, saving private Ryan, you know, complaints go up. Um, if there's issues, if there's problems, I take them to my boss. I will share them with him. I will share the frustration with the team. I try not to get too frustrated and upset in front of the team. It's hard. I do at times because we are humans. We have emotion, but really try to keep your emotion in check with your team because they will follow your lead. They will take what you're doing. Then have regular discussions with your team. I can't stress how important it is. I hold a weekly one-on-one -on -one with every single one of my direct reports so that we are fully connected. If there's any issues and concerns that they that they have, we're, we're having discussions around it. Um, I have a very good pulse on what they're doing, but I also have regular discussions with people who don't report directly to me. You know, some of the key people in the organization that are, you know, senior technical people on our teams, I have conversations with them. I also have conversations with people who are not just my seniors. So I want to understand, how are you doing? You know, what's the pulse? What, what can I do to help you? And if there's one thing I try to, you know, in, include in every meeting I have is, how can I help you? Whether it's at the middle or the end, you know, there's the, I always want to know what I can do to make my team's life easier, how I can help them. And, you know, without having those regular discussions and the regular communication, it's very difficult to understand and keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. And so being, being able to understand their concerns really will help you become, excuse me, really make you become a very effective manager and leader. Um, and then finally, take care of those who take care of you. You know, your, your, your team will do many things for you. They will work late nights, they will work weekends because they believe in what you're trying to build, what you're trying to grow. Um, if you need to give somebody a comp day because you know they worked a long time, give them a comp day. You know, these are some of the things that aren't officially written in your HR guidelines. Um, but you know, what you will find is that there are things that may not be completely written, but there's a shade of gray sometimes. And you know, as a, as a manager, you know, hey, take that day off. You know, or, you know, 
take take off early. You know, I've given my teams, you know, before holidays, like, hey, I appreciate everything you've done. Leave at noon today, right? Like, stop working at noon, go take the rest of the day off because you've all been working so hard, you deserve it. Um, I've given people days off, you know, hey, you're, you're, you're off on Monday. Why don't you take Friday too? Because you were up all, you know, last weekend working on something. You want to make sure that your team doesn't get burned out. You want to make sure you're taking care of them. Um, understand what their needs are. And, you know, it, it's not just giving days off. I mean, it can, you know, be very simple things, recognizing birthdays and, and, and doing, you know, various other things. One of the things that we've tried to do um, is we institute a happy hour on Fridays, right? We're all working remotely now. We're all virtual. We're not able to see each other in the, in the office. So, so every Friday at four o'clock, you know, pencils down, we all get online. We, 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 we share in a virtual drink together and we, I, I do it as an AMA session, so I, you know, if there's any questions my team wants to ask, they, 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 they can ask it. It's, you know, pretty much open game. I, I think I answer everyone, and if there's one that I can't answer, I don't know the answer, I'll be honest, and say I can't answer it or I don't know. Um, but then we play some games, and for an hour, we just get to be social together. Uh, you know, and it's, a, and it's a way to try and keep everybody connected. Um, yesterday, we held our Diwali Festival. Right. Um, that was 100 percent virtual, it's something that we've been doing, you know, for for eight years now. And it's kind of a, you know, it's a tradition that, that pulls all the teams together. We had about 100 people online. Um, you know, when you think that's about 10 percent of our company uh, that were that were online taking part in the in the festival yesterday. And although we couldn't share the food, um, which was a little disappointing, um, it was great to see everybody and great to see all the effort that went into the skits. So, you know, making sure you have those fun things for your team take care of them, make sure their needs are being met uh, is, is critical as, as, as a leader. And, and, and really, as I said, you know, it's, it's being that coach and making sure that your team has what they need to be successful. Um, so those are my prepared slides. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, in the, the 15 minutes or so remaining here, uh, we'll get some good discussion. Um, here's my contact information. If you want to jot it down, i um, uh, more than happy to to share this presentation with you if you want to take a look at it or if you want to connect and ask me questions afterwards. Um, certainly, please feel free to do so. But I'm going to take the screen share down because it gets a little bit weird when I pop over to here. Um, and this way I can see all of the, the questions that might come in. But um, certainly, if, if there are questions, I'm hoping that uh, we can have a pretty good discussion. Um, Everybody's shy this morning. Yes, and I, I, I do have a lot of Lego. My kids are uh, spoiled when it comes to Legos for sure. <laughs> um, so what remote management advice do you have? Um, first, I, I think the the one-on-ones that I have with with my team is is very critical. Uh, it's it's harder to keep in touch. Um, certainly, you know, we use Microsoft Teams, and so we're always on Teams. We're always talking. Um, I think one of the things that being remote, the work-life balance is really challenging right now, and so I I really try, unless there's an absolute need, to be respectful of people's time and not reach out to them after you you know work normal working hours or before normal working hours because it's so easy just to you know pop back up here for me in this bedroom and and, and start doing some more work because there's plenty of work to go around so i think managing in remotely it's it's respecting people's time um, but then having more frequent check-ins and just a simple ping on you know teams or if you're using you know slack or something else um, just to ping you you know your, your team to ask people just how are you how are things going right and, and staying in, in touch with them and um, the communication aspect is probably the, the biggest key now is it's the, there's more onus because you're not captive in an office anymore to understand and, and, and be in communication with your team um so how long have i been a manager and the size of my team so i've been a manager direct line manager i think for 10 11 years now um 
the size of my team is, is about 70 people at the moment, and I've managed teams of up to 150 um, in my career. Um, so, so as you mentioned, being sometimes you have to manage, sometimes you have to lead. What have you found has been an effective way to switch between the two pertaining to the situation? Um, that's a great question there. Um, there are times when, you know, especially in a lot of organizations, especially if you're a publicly traded company, you know, your your results are very important. So there's certain things that you need to, to manage to so that you can deliver. Um, you know, when you take a look at things that are maybe a compliance related issue or you're going through an audit, you know, those are those are things you manage as part of your day to day. Um, you know, certainly in the technology field, there's a lot of tech debt that we have. We have to manage that tech debt. Uh, we have to do regular upgrades and form regular upgrades on our on our systems. Those are the types of things that, you know, you, you manage those efforts. But in terms of leadership, um, it's, you know, setting the direction, the vision and saying, here's where we're going to be. Here's where I aspire as, as an organization to be. Here are the traits that we want to have. You know, we, you know, here is the type of technology we want to use. Um, here is what we need to provide for our customers and understanding, you know, what our customer needs is and how do we adjust so that we can deliver, you know, a lot more features and functionality to our customers on a continual basis. And so the leadership aspect comes in when you're trying to, you know, set that longer term vision, but then the management aspect comes into, you know, the, the day to day things that you're doing as you're managing through your backlog as you're managing sprint to sprint. What are the things that we're actively working on and being, you know, how do you manage those versus how do you set the, the vision on where we're going going to be? So that's a very good question. Um, if you were always taking the full blame for failures but giving the credit to others, wouldn't that make your managers think you possibly you were not needed? <laughs> uh, no, I, it, it, um, actually, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, if, if you're going to stand in front of your team and you're going to take you know the flack for things, um, they're going to greatly appreciate you. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that uh, they will they will know, you know, where the issues were. They will understand, you know, what broke, you know, where the bug was, you know, where the feature didn't turn out to be the, the right thing. Um, and if you're taking the heat and the blame and you're not blaming them or trying to assign blame on somebody because, you know, they made a mistake, uh, your team actually will greatly have much more greater appreciation for you and that you're taking the heat for things and not passing that heat down. Right, you pass the success to the team. You take you take the heat for things, um, because trust me, in your career, you're you're going to be in the frying pan quite a few times. Uh, it's just bound to happen. Um, and and when you sit in that pan and don't make your team do it, trust me, they will appreciate you much more. Um, uh, sharing in so the. the, the to fall into David's question, sharing in both failures and successes better. Um, you know. We do share in both, right? You know, my, the, the point I was making was more the outward expression of it. I'm not going to go in in, in 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 explaining a failure or explaining why something went wrong or, we, or why a bug was introduced into production. Uh, I'm not going to go to the specific individual that coded it and said that person made a mistake. It's our team's mistake. Like, hey, we missed this. It was something that slipped through. You know, I'm going to work to make it better. And, and then you work with your team to understand, all right, well, what happened? You know what needs to be, what improvements need to be made so that you can make those 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 changes. But you know, certainly your team is going to understand, um, you know how you how you're adjusting and managing those. Um, it is good to have different mentors in different stages of life. So I, Benka, I completely agree with that. Um, and to change your mentors too, right? Just because you have a mentor today doesn't mean that person's a mentor your entire life. Um, you know, one of my first mentors um, just published a book and I, I reached out to him. He, he, he ended up being, um, you know, he was a college professor of mine. And he was a professional. He worked at the first bank that, that um, I worked for when I graduated. And he was a he was an early mentor of mine when I first graduated. And he just published a book and, uh, you know, we connected on LinkedIn and I congratulated him for it and said, you know, hey, I, you know, I really appreciate everything that you helped with me as a mentor when I first got started um, because I was green, wide eyes open, wet behind the ears coming out of college uh, and, and he did a very good job. And so it's good to stay in touch and connect. I think LinkedIn does a great job allowing you to do that, but certainly continuing to, um, 
you know, evolve and change your mentors over time as your career evolves uh, is important. Um, what have you done when someone on your team is not being cooperative or maybe even disrespecting you or others? Um, that's a good question, Debbie, because you're going to have, um, you know, employee challenges like this. Um, you know, the first thing is, is to have conversation with them. You know, if they're not behaving appropriately, you know, have a discussion and, and, and get their perspective. Um, you know, as a coach, you know, when I would coach soccer, you know, when, when kids would come off the field, the first thing I would ask them is like, all right, tell me what's going on out there. What do you see? Right? Because I want to understand their perspective. I have mine, but I want to understand theirs. And so get their perspective first and then share back your perspective and say, all right, well, here's what I observed. Here's what I saw. And then get their feedback on it. Um, sometimes it's just a perception issue. Sometimes it's not, and you need to take, you know, further disciplinary action. But, you know, the first step is to, you know, have that conversation, understand what their issues and concerns are, um, you know, share your observations or share the concerns of others and see if that will improve it. If it doesn't, then, you know, typically there's, you know, progressive management um, tools that you can work with HR on to, to help. Hopefully you can make corrective action before that, but sometimes um, you're not able to do that. And so you do have to follow a progressive disciplinary process. Um, and typically your HR department can can help you with, with that. Um, but that's a great question because everybody's gonna face that in their career. Um, if I do any work after hours, I started making messages sent, not go out until 7 a.m. the next morning to keep them from feeling they have to have reply right away. That's a, that's a, that's a good idea, Craig, because, um, yeah, sometimes people feel, you know, you get a message from a senior leader in your organization, um, you know, at night or on a weekend. Sometimes the natural reaction of a person is, I got to reply to this right away. Um, you don't have to. It, it's, you know, it's your time. You know, it's your time with your family, it's your time with your friends. You know, we spend a lot of time working together during the week. Um, you don't have to respond right away. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I think it's great that you 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 hold off on those messages going out before seven so that uh, uh, your team doesn't feel that they have to do that. Um, so Paul says, I appreciate the reality you presented things, especially the rusty fingers for coding. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. Uh, there are different challenges for managers versus versus coding what helped you make the decision to transition to management um i actually made the transition into project management first and the reason i did this was that um from a technical perspective all of the project managers that, that at the time in the, in the you know, i was working at at the bank, um, they were all from a business perspective. And so they were all looking at business. They didn't understand the technology. Um, they, they had a very hard time managing technical people. Um, and I made a mistake one day and I went into, um, we had a new chief technology officer hired. Um, and I made the mistake one day of going in and introducing uh, myself to him and, 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 and expressing the concern that we've expressed to others, but hadn't gotten, um, traction. I was, I was young at the time and, um, uh, after about two or three days later, he called me into his office and said, hey, I want you to be my first technical project manager. Um, and so that's how I got into managing was, you know, helping technical projects and getting into management. And uh, I saw so many different opportunities to continue to improve. And it, and it just, it, my, my career just kind of snowballed from, you know, being a project manager to a senior project manager managing some very large efforts and organizations to then taking those skills that I had to, becoming, you know, a, a direct line manager and, and, and moving up. I, I've always stayed close to the technology and, and I don't get to play around as much as I do. Uh, it did in the past, but uh, I still love it. I still love learning about it. Um, you know, I'm planning on taking some, you know, we're, we're, we're in the process of moving into Microsoft Azure and so I'm probably going to take some classes to learn Azure more, but I actually went out and got my own Azure instance so that I can play around and use it just you know, a, I'm, I'm kind of a geek in that way that I like to learn and do these things myself. But I think it's good to know the technology. But yeah, um, I think one of my one of my architects is on. Uh, he wouldn't let me code, uh, so that's all right. Um, let's see. The team would appreciate it, but I am talking about your supervisor. Not sure what that means. I'm not sure what that means, David. The, you're talking about my supervisor. Okay. Um, and in fact, yeah, no, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, pleased to share, you know, is one of the things that I, 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 I think, you know, is, is important. Um, you know, I've been fortunate in my life, um, you know, and, and, and to be able to, to do things and provide, 
um, you know, for my family and others. Uh, I, I think giving back is important. You know, there's a lot of people that are that are less fortunate out there, and you know, it's part of the reason. You know, if you look at my LinkedIn, you know, I'm heavily involved with um, volunteering with uh, you know U.S. soccer, U.S. youth soccer, and and improving the youth game in the in the the country. You know, as with many things, you know, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers to entry there. Um, you know, especially for, for 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 kids that might be underserved. And how do we get them into the game? How do we reduce the barriers, especially from a financial and economic situation to get them in? Um, I, I, I want to give back. It's important for the for us and for those of us that are fortunate to, to do these types of things. And for me, you know, volunteering is is important. And I think we all should give back in, in, in any way that we can. And certainly, you know, being a mentor and sharing these things with you, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, so thank you all. If there's... If there's um, uh, David says he was responding to his previous comment. Let me just go back up. Oh, um, no. So, so David's referring to, um, you know, if I'm always taking the blame and giving credit to the team, um, wouldn't that make my manager think I'm not needed? Uh, so certainly the, the, the converse is also true. Um, you are recognized for, for what your team delivers. Right. Um, and it gets back to what I said before, you know, take care of those who take care of you. Um, you're going to be measured on on your results. Now, if I was always going in, taking the blame because we were constantly making mistakes, that probably would be a, would be a bad thing. Um, but certainly our teams produce quite a bit. And, you know, the recognition is that, you know, from my standpoint, I'm setting the vision, I'm setting on where we want to go. I'm giving them the support they need, the guidance, the, you know, the, the training, um, you know, helping to align them to make sure that they, are, they have the tools that they need to be successful. Um, and so your leadership will recognize where that's coming from and they will understand that. And trust me, you, I've been, in, I've been, you know, the frying pan a few times. And, uh, you know, when I said to senior executives, like, look, this was a mistake. Um, you know, we, we learned some things from it. Here's what happened. I don't throw anyone under the bus, but, you know, here's what we learned and here's what we're going to do to make it better. And trust me, the executives, they'll be frustrated. Um, they'll be unhappy. But if you go in there and, and you take ownership of it and you tell them what you're going to do to fix it and, and, and the team's going to focus on making sure that this doesn't happen again, that's much better. Now, if you're going before them with the same issue over and over, that's not a good sign, right? Because that, that shows you're not learning from your from your mistakes. But being able to go in there and, and, and be humble and say, yep, I own this. We'll we'll make sure it gets fixed. You'll get a lot more respect from your from your from your senior higher ups. Um. Okay. Perfect. So, um. Yes, thank you, um, Subroto Misha. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Misha is one of my architects. Uh, I knew he was going to be joining. He's probably laughing right now that I just mentioned him. But yeah, there's no way Misha would let me code anything at the moment. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll try at some point maybe. So uh, I appreciate. It. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> that's right. So. Uh, Please, if you have any other questions, um, reach out to me. Um, I really had a pleasure sharing, you know, my experience with you. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to to learn something, something you might be able to take back to, you know, whether it's your teams or help you in your careers. Um, you know, I hope that if you don't have a mentor, certainly you go out and find someone. Um, don't be afraid to ask someone to be a mentor because people who have gone and have, have achieved higher levels of positions, they didn't just do it on their own. There was people that helped them along the way as well, and they're willing to give back to. Um, so don't be shy. Don't be afraid of asking. And don't be afraid of being a mentor for somebody else. Pay it forward. So um, thank you. If there's there's no other questions, I think we are right at time. So that worked out perfect. Um, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you very much. And uh, enjoy. Cheers.